start. Hello, six John. O'clock. How are you? Very well. My name is Mary Clark. I'm with the Edmund Heron Center here and also at the uh, Heritage Museum downtown. So I'm really happy to see everybody here and welcome you to the fourth and final session of our summer history lecture program. It's been, we've had some really, really good uh, presentations and I think, uh, I think we have a really good, uh, good one to top it off tonight. Um, feel free, there's refreshments over here. If you haven't already uh, signed the guest book, please, uh, please go ahead and sign that before, uh, before you leave. Um, our speaker tonight, our speaker tonight is Dr. Kelly Houston Jones. She's an associate professor of history at uh, Arkansas Tech University in Russellville, and the graduate director also there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, after receiving a BA at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock and an MA at the University of North Texas, um, she earned her PhD from the University of Arkansas in 2014. Her research focuses on American slavery particularly in the uh, Trans-Mississippi South, that means Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> and, and her work has appeared in uh, um, a number of edited volumes and um, uh, periodicals and way, way too many to, to mention, but um, some look, look very interesting. Her latest book, last summer, published last summer? Uh, spring 21. Spring 21, okay. Um, it's called A Weary Land, Slavery on the, on the Ground in Arkansas. So we're really pleased to have Dr. Jones uh, here tonight. So please give her a good welcome. So what I'm going to do first is tell you where you can get the book, if that's not too shameless. <laughs> I'm going to give you a discount code. Um, some people drive around with copies of their book, like in the trunk of the car, you know, and then sort of peddle them at these things. And the press that I work with doesn't make that like very easy to do. Um, the book is published with University of Georgia Press, so sometimes people look for it at the University of Arkansas Press site, but it's University of Georgia Press. The series is called Early American Places, and so the uh, point of that book series is to pull in books that really dig into local, you know, regions. So my book was a good fit um, for that. And so um, you can go online to the University of Georgia Press website. I think it's ugapress.org, but you should probably just Google the University of Georgia Press. <laughs> and um, they'll make you create a login when you buy books um, from them, like a lot of um, university presses do. Um, and when you get through there, there will be a place where you can type in a discount code. And I think it's like 15, 20%. I mean, it's a pretty decent little you know, chunk that comes off. And the code is 08, C as in cat, L, A as in apple, S as in Sally, 08, C, L, A, S. And I've tested it out recently, and I know it still works. But if it doesn't work... Email me at kjones116 at atu.edu. It's Arkansas Tech um, email address. kjones116 at atu.edu. If you just email <coughs> kjones at atu, you're going to get the first K. Jones, and I'm the 116th K. Jones <laughs> at Arkansas <laughs> Tech. Right? So, um, now, the hardback version, you know, they'll release them in hardback and it's, it's a pricier book and then they'll move to paperback if it sells well enough. So the paperback should be available next month. So if you get on there and you want to spend less, choose paperback, but you'll technically be pre-ordering by, you know, a few weeks. Um, but if you want a hardback, then, you know, it's a little bit, you know how you first do press. Okay, so there's my little commercial <laughs> for how to get your hands um, on this. Uh, what I usually try to do, and I gave um, a couple to our local libraries, you have, get your library to get it. That way, one person is spending the money and then everybody has to share it, right? Um, well, I am very happy to be here with you guys. Uh, my first professor job was at a little school in Middle Tennessee called Austin P. State University. Some people know where that's at. And um, I was so excited to <coughs> snag a job in the South, snag a job, 
job in a place that's almost as pretty as Arkansas. Middle Tennessee is pretty great. Not as great as Arkansas, but really close. Um, and I had wonderful colleagues, but when um, Tom DeBlack at Arkansas Tech retired, um, I could not resist the opportunity to come home because I'm from um, just the next county <coughs> over. And so one of the things that made that a draw for me was the ability to go around and talk to people locally about their history. So, you know, around Middle Tennessee, I could talk to people about broader, you know, um, Southern history stuff, but they weren't that interested in all this Arkansas slavery stuff that I had all the time in my pocket. And so it's just such a blessing for me to be able to do this. Um, so what I'm going to do here is start with just kind of making sure that everybody understands that slavery was absolutely central to Arkansas's economy from the very first time anybody with white skin like me showed up um, in this area. So I may be preaching to the choir, but sometimes I run up against a little bit of resistance uh, to that. So I just want to start with that. Every single corner of this state, and back when it was a territory, of course, including this one, uh, was a place where um, folks used the labor of people of African descent as chattel um, to build their economic gains. In every single part of the territory in the state after it, the um, slaveholding class got the best land first. They got the county offices, which back in that day was the most powerful um, government office, right, when, when it comes to people's day-to-day -day lives, um, all of that um, stuff. And so um, what I'd like to do is point out that the slavery that comes to Arkansas is a more developed type of chattel slavery. When I say chattel, I mean it's not um, like Native American captive slavery where you, you defeat your enemies in war and therefore you take captives. You might kill all the men and take the women and children um, as captives in <coughs> society. That society has lost honor. The people who have um, been captured are now people lists, right? They don't have their own families and their own connections. But there is a way kind of out of that status perhaps within their lifetime in that community and certainly their babies and grandbabies don't inherit that kind of, so there's, that's captive slavery. Um, world history has many examples of that kind of slavery. Um, there's a type of slavery called debt slavery, right? Where the thing that makes you lose honor and a little bit of personhood is the fact that you don't have any money. <laughs> um, and so you're going to have to be beholden to someone else um, for that reason. But again, that's not necessarily inherited um, by your descendants, and it's not based on either of these. Um, neither of those other kinds of slavery are based on um, religion, race, you know, those kinds of things. And so the kind of slavery that we talk about when we're talking about American slavery is racial chattel slavery, where the people are bought and sold, taxed, willed, mortgaged, gifted, what am I missing? <laughs> Fought over, okay, sued, <laughs> white people suing each other over them, just like cattle. And so that's why it's called chattel slavery for that older word um, for cattle. So they're treated um, in most legal situations as movable property, but in some legal disputes, more like um, real estate. Um, and so this is the harsher, more capitalistic form of slavery that hits this part of the world about the time Arkansas is sort of becoming as a territory and sort of moving to statehood is um, what a lot of historians call the second slavery. Um, so if you say the second slavery, then you're sort of assuming, like, okay, there, there's a first slave. What's the, what's the first slavery? Um, the first chapter of American slavery is one that's not growing as quickly. It's a more diversified economy. And it's a phase of American slavery um, where the leaders of the society, the people who have formal political power, kind of assume that it will eventually kind of die out. So think of like Thomas Jefferson and Friends, okay, that era of American slavery. Um, Thomas Jefferson famously said that, uh, you know, slavery is like not great, but we're sort of stuck with it. Um, I'm obviously paraphrasing some of the stuff that he said. <laughs> he recognizes it as evil, but not evil enough that he's going to stop doing it because he likes really nice wine and cheese and leather down books and all the stuff that, you know, pretty clothes. I mean, you know, Jefferson, he likes his stuff. And he was in debt all the time. So if he 
writes about the evil of slavery, but he thinks like, yeah, I'm sort of, we're sort of stuck with it. It'll die out eventually. You know, they assumed that being the importation of new populations of Africans into um, the Americas at all would sort of like help it to like sort of die out um, eventually. That first slavery is defended in um, a defense that we call the necessary evil defense. The necessary evil defense of slavery is one where um, folks are saying, they're admitting that it's immoral, maybe even evil or unchristian, okay, to hold other people as chattel, but they, the sort of, you know, the, the sort of Thomas Jefferson outlook of like, you know, it'll eventually go away, it'll fizzle out, we'll do better, we'll find a way to detach, you know, from this. But there is an admission, there's like just a hint of like, eh, and they're not that proud of it, okay, sort of sweeping it under the rug. Um, you guys probably know our Constitution does not directly engage on um, this issue. It's very carefully, that's not by accident, right? they're very careful about skirting around this. Well, by the time you get to, certainly into um, Arkansas coming into its own as a state, they have shifted, because of this second slavery being so profitable, they've shifted to what we call the positive good defense of slavery. It's the positive good defense of slavery that gathers enough people who have formal political power that they're willing to rebel against the United States of America and die to protect the right to hold humans as chattel. That's what the Confederacy was created for, to protect this second slavery. The positive good defense of slavery says there is no willingness, okay, um, in this defense to admit anything immoral or evil or anything about that. In fact, the positive good defense of slavery says not only is slavery not evil, but it's the best way to have an economy and society. This is how Jesus wants it, and we need to make sure that our kids and our grandbabies and everyone else behind them, you know, um, keeps doing this. Wow, right? It's a, um, they always say the best defense is a good offense, right? And so that's what, that's what's happening here. Why? Why do they get so um, invested that they would pull, pull Arkansas and all these other states as well um, out of the United States into the Confederacy and willing to give up everything, right, um, to protect it? It's because it's incredibly profitable. I'm the cynical speaker this summer. <laughs> did you have, I don't know, did you guys, did you have Sharice Jones Branch? Because she's pretty cynical too. Like we, we're always like bringing the bad news. Um, so, um, the second slavery, it's more capitalistic. It's harsher. It's um, devouring land, moving, sort of marching westward, based on one staple crop, which is cotton. Not to say that other crops aren't sort of wrapped into that. Certainly those sort of sugar districts right around Louisiana and stuff are going to, you know, benefit uh, from this. But cotton is the thing that drives it, okay? Okay, so now I'll get to, I'll, I'll stop sort of ad-libbing here and get to a little bit more of a structured um, thing here. This more intense capitalistic version of chattel slavery grows at an exponential rate. It reinvigorated the internal slave trade. The second slavery focused overwhelmingly on producing huge quantities of cotton. Its calling card was its rapid transformation of the economies of areas that had before only been peripheral to the main economy, Arkansas. Um, it already touched Mississippi, parts of Missouri, western Alabama. Um, when you get to Arkansas's territory's creation without restrictions on slavery in 1819, you're sort of swinging the doors open and inviting whites to pour into Arkansas with their <coughs> captives and carve out the precious parts of this growing cotton kingdom. So as a result of this, the enslaved population of Arkansas is going to shoot up from about 1,600, that's 11% of the total population in 1820, to a little over 4,500 in 1830, which is about 15% of the total population. This is pretty sparse in comparison to Arkansas's neighbors. Um, but you may know that Arkansas had a reputation for being sort of lawless and wild in a place where people grew up to no good will flee to, and it, it's kind of true, um, that part of it. Um, and so the, that has something to do with the lag in development. Um, but it's going to start as a trickle, but it's going to come in um, um, pretty quickly once it gets going. A 
central part of that process is Indian removal. So I always try to make sure that my students understand that Indian removal, if Trail of Tears being one sort of, that's the one they all know, right? Trail of Tears being one facet, a bit larger, Indian removal. Indian, Indian removal and this second slavery marching west, those, those are intertwined processes. You don't know, they're connected. You can't really talk about one um, without the other. So that notorious Indian Removal Act of 1830 set in motion the conclusion of the process of clearing Native Americans under their tribal governments, not all Native Americans, but Native Americans under their tribal governments from the Southeast United States and of course through Arkansas to Indian Territory. White businesses and the infrastructure here benefited from federal funds granted to those in Arkansas who wanted to facilitate those removals across the state. Um, I've got an example here for you, a slaveholding merchant named Maurice Wright got his start in Cane Hill in Washington County. Uh, you know, he's up there like really close to um, Indian Territory. Uh, in the 1830s, he sets up this partnership with his brother and they're selling pork to the newly arriving Cherokees. Whites in and around Arkansas forced Native Americans and their tribal governments off of Arkansas's ground and hurried displaced groups through Arkansas in order to force captive African Americans onto the ground in Arkansas. One person writing to the Arkansas Gazette in the use, these years who didn't sign their name, they just signed it as a citizen, wrote speaking for <coughs> probably most whites at the time and expressing a vision of an Arkansas that was no longer a swampy, wild place populated by buffalo and by um, what he or she called savages, uh, but rather an agrarian paradise where, quote, the earth is made to perform the offices for which she was intended by the god of nature. And so these settlers are going to construct and keep up their seats of power, their trade, in territorial Arkansas with the labor and the value of African Americans as chattel. Enslaved people were crucial in the establishment of the earliest trading posts in the territory in terms of their labor, but also their value as assets. I've got an example here for you that's pretty local. John Miller and a Frenchman named William Drope, and he's his name is spelled in the territorial court records, D-R-O-P-E. So it might be Drope, right, since he's French, but you know what, I'm from Conway County, I'm gonna say Drope, uh, William Drope. Um, so Miller and Drope, they set up a partnership for a venture out here at Davidsonville. And I'm sure you know that Davidsonville was the most important trading post of this zone um, of Arkansas territory. They relied on the labor of an enslaved Boy, So they're calling him a boy, but of course, he may very well have been 50, okay? So that is just a diminutive um, term um, for male enslaved people. So it's hard to get, kind of get, actually get a guess of his age. Drope already owned a store, and this arrangement he sets up for, you know, he's going to pay Miller to run the store. Miller's going to buy skins and furs. And Miller is, that's not me, is it? And Miller's going to uh, transport goods. Drope promises to provide this, quote, Negro boy, and his job is going to be to, quote, beat and preserve such peltries, meaning the skins, and furs as might be purchased um, from the traders at the post. So Drope allows Miller to employ this man, um, who's not named in the record, for his own personal use, too. And he's buying, processing, transporting goods. So they, um, here they are in Davidsonville. Um, as you guys know, it's established in um, 1815. It's not that populated between court dates and land sales, those kind of like public events. So this is, is going to seem like a pretty desolate place for this unnamed, perhaps adolescent, perhaps older um, enslaved man. There were a few hundred, maybe 2,000 people in the era, in the area um, at the time. This guy who's forced to work for Drope and Miller, he's at this trading hub where all of these different um, goods, 
are um, trading hands. News, right, is um, trading hands. So he's in a bustling part of Arkansas at the same time that he's in a very remote part of the country by um, white and black standards of the 19th century. Native Americans, of course, not going to find it that um, remote. So this um, partnership goes on for a few years and then dissolves. We don't know what happened to this um, enslaved man. He probably goes back with this um, drope um, Frenchman. The venture benefited the Miller guy enough that he borrows money from John Crittenden in 1824 to purchase nearly $4,000 worth of men and women in New Orleans. That's a massive amount of money at that time. And so Miller's got his plan to either begin his own um, plantation or he's going to turn into just a full-blown um, slave trader. Now the reason that we know anything about this is because you've got, you know, these guys end up falling out and they sue each other. So, so much of what we find out about enslaved people's lives, certainly in these really early years, is, you know, coming through those court records, which of course aren't designed to tell you the story of this man, you know, who's being forced um, to work for them. So I want to switch the view here and let you know that, you know, Miller and Drope and all these other folks um, have one idea of what Arkansas is going to be, you know, what that landscape is going to mean. But enslaved people see it very differently, you know. They use the fact that they are in what white and black 19th century southerners would have thought of as just the edge of the civilized world, okay? There's, yeah. uh, people just don't, they think the west side of the Mississippi River is just, and people still, there's a lot of people still, right? <laughs> people like, eh, hey, can we just stop at Memphis? Like, you know, go any further uh, than that. So that, that exists at this time. But enslaved people are using the ruggedness of this landscape against the, their enslavers. So the very thing that pulls them out there, right, this environment that's so fertile for cotton, it's uncultivated, it's um, cheap land, okay, for whites to bring in um, folks to uh, make a profit. That draw, um, the landscape is the draw, and the landscape is also a tool um, for them to uh, resist. And that really is the theme of the whole book, you know, is how they're sort of trying to flip um, the situation here. In the 1820s, the Arkansas Gazette complained of runaways lurking around Little Rock, hiding in the thickets during the day, sneaking into town at night to steal provisions, craftily avoiding the posses sent to subdue them. Arkansas's ground proved a magnet for escapees from the Cotton South's more settled areas, relatively more settled areas. Um, one of my favorite examples of this um, in the early period of Arkansas history is um, an enslaved man named Jack, who was actually known as Chunky Jack, um, who ran away from James K. Polk's plantation. This was oh, like okay. before he's president. So it's just a whole, this is how I ended up in, I sort of dig this stuff up and work on this stuff because I have sort of a side interest in absentee-owned plantations. That's why my description online is like, Western South, because some of my, a lot of my absentee on plantations that I'm researching are not strictly um, Arkansas. Um, so I got interested in that, and so I ended up now one of the people in the James K. Polk history world. I get invited to <laughs> give talks about James K. Polk's plant, like, and they ask questions. I'm like, I don't actually know anything about James K. Polk, you guys. You ask me about the plantation. You ask me about these, these kind of stories. Um, but this guy, known as Chunky Jack, he ran away from James K. Polk's plantation um, in Somerville, Tennessee, which is like western Tennessee. And he heads for the swamps of Arkansas in November 1833. And he takes off um, the future president has got to pull all these strings and kind of enlist his network of relatives, friends, acquaintances, okay, in Tennessee and uh, Mississippi um, and Arkansas uh, to help him. And they end up um, eventually apprehending Jack in Helena after a few weeks of him being at large. Well, then he gets away again, and this time he heads for, and again, remember, he's not heading north. He's heading west, because that's where the hope is, okay, for him. It's these, this, the swamps, it's sort of difficult to be pursued. There's, you know, probably almost certainly other runaways hiding there, you know, he might be able to 
um, sort of put in common cause with. So he gets away again, and again he heads to um, he heads west. He heads to Arkansas Territory, this um, particular area that people called Shawnee Village, and it's um, notorious uh, to people in Arkansas and outside of Arkansas as a place for you know bandits to gather and and they're. Um, robbing people coming down the Mississippi River, and sometimes they're setting up obstructions and making steamboats crash and then robbing them. It's just wild, okay? So that's the vicinity of where uh, they think he, they're worried, you know, that he might be. And so um, the overseer, James K. Polk's overseer, knows the reputation um, of this area, and he writes to Polk, I tell you the fact, I don't think you will ever get him from that den of thieves. <laughs> and he did eventually get him back. He gets Jack back, but he, um, he ends up spinning, you know, he's got to pay the um, sheriff, right, of Phillips County for holding him, and then he's got to pay, he pays his buddy for helping track him down. Jack ran up a bill at a tavern. Okay, he's got to pay this tavern you know, as well. So he ends up... Um, Costing even beyond that, though, because once an enslaved person gets a reputation for running away, then the value goes down, um, according to right other you know um, enslavers. And so he's really frustrated. James K. Polk ends up having to buy his neighbor's blacksmith, enslaved blacksmith, because on one of these trips he had taken the blacksmith with him, and they both get caught. I can't remember if it's a second or anyway. He, he, he does this a lot. And so his James K. Polk's neighbor is saying, this blacksmith is worth hundreds of dollars less now than he was before because everybody knows he ran away to the swamps of Arkansas, and now what am I going to do? And so to smooth it over, Polk has to, or he feels like he has to, you know, buy at a discount um, the neighbor's spot. And it's not his neighbor, he doesn't live there, but the neighboring plantation um, blacksmith. But this is a dangerous place. I don't mean to make light of, you know, these, the stakes here are very high um, for people. There's cover for runaways, but you've also, we're talking about people who were exploited. They're sick from displacement. Um, they're disoriented after being forced out to uh, the Trans-Mississippi South. They're really struggling to survive the natural landscape and the social landscape, right? And the landscape of, of agriculture and labor as well. In one snippet from the um, court records in this Part of the world here. I, I know it's a Lawrence County situation, but you know the county is like it starts out massive and then it's like so it's always hard for me. So don't ask me exactly where okay, this would have um, been. But there was an incident where a man described as a quote decrepit old Negro man um, suffered insults and a beating by an attorney um, in Lawrence County named Seaborn Sneed. Uh, when he had, when the man had dared enter the room where Sneed was shuffling his books, and so we don't know if he's free. He's probably enslaved, but he might be um, a free man. Um, he's probably enslaved because I think what what brings it to um, the court is that his um, owner is suing, like you injured this guy, you know that I'm that I'm holding. So you just never know. I mean, these people are beholden to the whims of people who aren't even their technical like owners. Um, between 1810 and 1860, more than 80,000 enslaved people were forced into Arkansas. By 1860, enslaved Arkansans numbered more than 111,000. That's an increase of 136% in 10 years. Um, the only place where slavery was growing faster in the United States than Arkansas was a chunk of East Texas. So the population is lower overall. The Portion is lower overall than some of the neighboring parts of the South. Um, at um, the 1860 census, the enslaved population of Arkansas is about a quarter. So one in four Arkansans was held as chattel in 1860. That proportion is actually a little lower than some other parts you know, um, of the South. But the overall population is growing faster in Arkansas than those other parts of the South. So had slavery continued, right, the, it just would have, the numbers would have gotten even um, larger. So most who endured this relocation experienced a massive disruption. And I want to tell you the story of a guy named Harvey Osborne. He came to Arkansas from North Carolina. He was born in 1825 on um, a farm near Asheville, North Carolina. His enslaver named Morgan Osborne is seeking opportunities for 
profit from cotton cultivation in what we call the Old Southwest, that cotton expansion zone. So he drives Harvey and some others to Arkansas in 1850. Um, after you know, all of these weeks of travel, they settle on a large tract of land along the White River about 10 miles from Baseville. And that's as specific as I can get on that one um, for you. Um, when they get there, the slave owner hires Harvey out for a year to another plantation because he's pro probably because he's getting ready for the agricultural production, the one at the land that um, he bought. Um, and also, probably it's probably a yes and situation. It's also ready cash that he can use to get that plantation started, right? The income from that hire. So Harvey is he goes under this massive relocation, and then he gets temporarily separated, right, for a year from the people who he had come out here um, with, um, and he probably never saw his parents or, you know, the people he had been separated from in North Carolina um, ever again. And those abrupt disconnections are the norm. Now, every once in a while you can find evidence of these connections. I've got one of my most um, cherished archival discoveries were from a woman who was who came out to Arkansas from not very far from in North Carolina where Harvey came from. And um, she comes out, and the branch of the White family that stays in North Carolina writes letters out to, they go, they end up in Hempstead County. So the North Carolina branch of the family is writing letters to the Hempstead County branch of the family. And they'll say, tell Aunt Jenny, Aunt is another sort of diminutive way to show a drop of respect without <laughs> actually, right, giving, it's just kind of acknowledging that you're older or something. Um, and so they'll say, oh, do you tell Aunt Jenny this? And they're telling her news about the a black community that she left by force, okay, um, on this trip. And um, there's some evidence that she might even have gotten to go back when some of uh, the white family went, you know, on a visit back. But the norm is that total disruption um, because it's really costly to, 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 to travel back and forth and these people end up being sold and all of that kind of stuff. So let me talk to you a little bit about the Jacob Wolf House since we're up in this, um, you know, kind of uh, White River zone here. I tried to make sure I pull some things that might be of interest to North Arkansas uh, folks. Um, one of the things that really struck me recently was when I saw the Arkansas, I think it was the Arkansas Made page. Now, I'm not here to hate on any institution because the Arkansas Made folks, they, they're connected to the um, efforts of the Historic Arkansas Museum. They do incredible work. I don't know if you, if you guys are on Facebook and um, they're like really old people on Facebook. But, if you guys are like me and on Facebook, um, you can follow the Arkansas Made page if you haven't already. And it's wonderful woodworking, pottery, painting, um, architecture, just all kinds of really great stuff. And I think it was them who recently posted something about the Jacob Wolf House, okay, on um, the White River. And the story of enslaved people was completely missing. Now, granted, it was like a two paragraph thing. But you know how much I can get in in two paragraphs? I can get it in there, you know? And it was like the way it was worded, and what they had done is they had taken language from earlier stuff without, I mean, they're just, you know, they're just, it might have been some college kid intern just trying to put something on Facebook, you know? Um, so I'm not trying to, you know, so don't go tell them I hate, I love them, I love what they do. Um, and, um, but it was as if the enslaved people didn't exist there. I mean, the language was about what, you know, Jacob Wolf and, you know, his brother, I think, was a blacksmith or something, and how they had, made it out there, you know, on the frontier and how they had prospered. It's like, no, you know, there's more to it. And I did gently say, oh, okay, well, you know, here's how many enslaved people lived here this time. Like, here's what this story, you know, is about. So it just takes us um, gently, you know, I mean, you don't have to be doing what you don't want to, but I find that it behooves me <laughs> to tread lightly and just like, hey, why don't we incorporate this information? Let's get the complete, you know, story um, here. So here he is. He built this house. It's on the confluence of the white uh, North Fork, um, a spot to literally observe, right, Arkansas's uh, early economic and political growth. Um, people are going and going. Um, I think it's sitting in, now it's in Baxter County, right? Is there close yeah. to that mile? Okay. I think it was Izzard County, but the, yeah, okay. Um, so Jacob Wolf probably brought enslaved people with him when he showed up there. Um, He's, he's got 76 acres by 1829. Ten years later, there are at least four enslaved people living on the site, 
and he had expanded to more than 250 acres. Um, by 1850, there's at least 12 enslaved people living there, um, and, um, and then it's going to keep growing um, by 1860. <coughs> and he gets to where he's got more than 20 residing in uh, three cabins. And I'm sure some of you have spent some time, because I saw the list over here in the um, slave schedule you know, of the U.S. Census. Sometimes they'll put in there how many um, houses, and sometimes they don't. But this one lists three. So Jacob Wolfe is active in early Arkansas politics. He's representing um, his um, community in the Territorial Assembly. He opens his home as an official space where people are coming and going. They're exchanging political ideas. They're settling appointments. They're delivering speeches. And enslaved people who lived there would have witnessed all of this. So they know what's going on. They know um, what's at stake. Um, they would have witnessed an 1850 meeting there, chaired by Wolf that was called for, quote, Southern rights, and they would have heard Jacob Wolf advocate that Arkansas participate in a um, famous, for um, folks in my line of work, Nashville Convention, to argue for their, quote, sacred rights to slave labor. You can hear that positive good defense, right, of slavery. So access to this kind of information is helping enslaved people fashion their own concept of formal politics, um, they understand the stakes of the sectional crisis, they understand what the Civil War is about, and they understand which side is probably best for them, right? Well before um, Lincoln comes along, they're developing a political understanding. Wolf's defense of slavery received support because of slavery's value to the area's economy. And I can hit you with some numbers here. In 1839, enslaved people made up 28% of Izzard County's taxable wealth, nearly 40% of that in 1843. That's going to shrink a little bit um, in the 10 years after that. Uh, it's still a pretty good chunk of the assets of people who live um, in what's then, you know, Izzard County. The enslaved people there are doing work like growing corn, uh, and, and, their, and their neighbors are also doing this, growing cotton. Uh, most of the operations are pretty small. The average number of enslaved people per household in that area was almost six. Uh, the statewide average holding is eight, okay? uh, which is small, I guess, but not really when you think about the wealth that that represents. Okay? So if an enslaved man who's about 25 is worth or is being sold, bought and sold for about 1500 bucks. And we understand that a pretty decent yearly job pays about $400 a year. This is an incredible, incredible um, amount of wealth that we're talking about, all told. Um, okay, so 91 of the 449 enslaved people in Izzard County in 1860 lived on plantation-sized holdings. Kind of gives you a sense of how there's quite a mix, right? A lot of smaller holdings and then a handful of plantations where you get um, larger enslaved communities. So they're gonna be not as lonely on a plantation-sized operation, which we usually define as 20 or more enslaved people. I'm sure you can imagine that a plantation with 20 people held um, there and a plantation with 120 people held there is a pretty big you know, difference, um, but we, we generalize when we have to. So, um, one thing I do want to point out, and this is really relevant for this part uh, of the state, is that cotton is going to become king, but first and for longest, it's corn and cattle that are going to rule Arkansas. And it's certainly true in the 1840s. Um, about the time, uh, well, it's a handful of years after Arkansas's granted statehood, um, Arkansas farmers produced 5 million bushels of corn. It's impossible to tell how much of that is slave-grown corn because the agricultural census <coughs> is in such bad shape. You know, you can go through the pages of the manuscript census and see population. You can open up the one, like this has been tallied up nicely over there for the enslaved population. There's also an agricultural one. A lot of people don't know that. Or you can find people and see you know, what they're growing. But it's always in really bad shape in my experience. It can be very hard um, to read. Um, so it can be... So it's, I, it's always impossible for me to tell people how much of the cotton grown in a county was grown by enslaved people in a given, you know, census year. But I can get, I can get pretty close sometimes. 
So now the thing to point out about this is that corn is fueling people, it's fueling stock, right? So many bushels of corn is going to get your meat for the year, you feed enslaved people um, for the year, and so all of it's going into the input um, of the operation. And so don't think of a farm or a plantation as doing sort of only one thing. Um, only the biggest plantations are so big that they're focusing only on cotton and just importing food. It's so much more costly um, to do it that way. I think what I want to do here now is talk to you a little bit about how I want to get away from the agricultural stuff and just make sure to drive home the point of the investment of enslaved people as assets, easily liquidated assets, as being a driver of the economy. Um, one of the things that I find is a misconception when I talk to people about this is that they'll assume that a small enslaved population means that slavery is not like that important to the economy there. Um, hopefully, we don't. Hopefully, you guys have long since dropped, you know, um, that kind of assumption. But I think also a sort of cousin of a misconception of that um, is the idea that people who aren't the um, direct owners of enslaved people aren't benefiting economically from that, right? So the ability to rent enslaved people out, that's how a lot of widows took care of themselves, was renting out enslaved people to non-slaveholding neighbors. So non-slaveholding households have the ability to rent that labor and, you know, for, usually it's a year, okay? Um, and so they're benefiting, okay, from that. Um, I, I hope I made the point um, with Davidsonville that the early trading posts are facilitated by enslaved people working and making that kind of um, economy happen. Um, there's also the um, benefit of what one historian calls slavery's hidden engine, and that is the mortgaging of enslaved people. So, slaveholders are able to kind of um, lubricate the area's economy with the ability to mortgage their enslaved people for debts, okay? So using enslaved people as property to secure a debt is something that's benefiting the slaveholder, but it's also something that's benefiting that other person as well, right? Um, in the transaction. So even if that person isn't a slaveholder, they're implicated um, in this. Let me give you some examples. And now I want to give a shout out here. Nancy Snell Griffith did yeoman's work in the local records of Independence County, and that's what I'm pulling from here. Uh, I've got some examples here for you. 1853, Freeman and Caroline were mortgaged by Elisha and Taylor Baxter to J.C. and Andrew Gaynor for $5,469.74. That mortgage was settled in 1855. So for a couple years there, these people don't know if they're gonna to get to stay home or not, right? So there are implications um, to this. There are many examples of people relying on the ability to use um, their enslaved property as security for debt. And uh, Rachel, a woman named Rachel, was mortgaged by Andrew Lyle three different times in 1861 alone. And so each time she's, oh, you know, you don't know what's going to, you know, but there's so much uncertainty built into um, this for these folks. Jim and Jane were mortgaged twice within a year for debts held by H.F. Fairchild. <clears throat> there was a woman named Eliza, and her children were mortgaged together um, several times over 20 years to secure the debts um, of different, uh, different folks. Sometimes you get fights between heirs when the patriarch dies and you've got, you know, kids and a widow and grandkids perhaps, you know, people with uh, various amounts of, like, literal interest in um, the enslaved people who are left behind. That is also a big enough benefit economically that they will, are willing to fight for any little um, bit of this. In August 1856, Archibald and Ann Burns sold their one-half interest in a 19-year-old girl named Julia Ann and her six-month-old baby named Lorilla. They sold 50% of their interest. They're, they only own 50% of this woman named Julia Ann and her baby, and they sell that interest to someone else. Do you understand what I'm saying? Obviously, she can't be split in two, but they're going to benefit 50% of what, she, what value um, she's bringing in. For 
$400, by the way. Robert and Ann Lidwell sold their one-seventh interest in a 22-year-old named Columbus to Charles Moore for $100. And again, $100 um, is a lot you know, um, at that time. So even partial ownership of an enslaved person is a boon for white Arkansas families' finances, and they're willing to fight um, to keep it. I don't want to take too long and take up, but I do want to tell you guys a little bit about, let me tell you about this woman um, named Marianne Millam, and then I'll call it, okay? And then we can have questions, and let's see what else you guys want to talk about. Um, Mary Ann Millam lived on a farm on the Cache River. Um, she's at this crossroads linking Pocahontas and, I'm going to say Powhatan, Powhatan, because when I teach the early um, part of the U.S. history class, you know, you're talking about Pocahontas and the Powhatans, but this is like straight up, this is just Powhatan, right? That's, 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 that's the white way to say it. No, yeah, no, and so that's the right way, right? You say how you, yeah, it's like um, Monticello, you know, Monticello, Arkansas is Monticello. Sometimes people try to correct me, they're like, oh, it's Monticello. Like, no, Monticello, Arkansas is Monticello, right? So let me tell you about this woman, Mary Ann Millam. I've got, what I've got here is a mix of information from the WPA ex-slave interviews. A little bit of census um, record, a little bit of tax records, a little bit of newspaper. Okay, kind of hodgepodge together here to find out what little I can. She, she's living there at that crossroads, um, uh, linking Pocahontas to Powhatan. The only enslaved family on the premises, Mary Ann and her children, including her daughter, um, and her daughter Betty is the one who's going to tell the family story to the WPA interviewer. They stayed in this... Um, small, low-ceilinged cabin. John and Nancy Nutt are their enslavers. They reside in a double pan home with a large porch facing west. Mary Ann and Betty were not technically owned by the Nutts, however. But they're owned by law um, by Lewis Hanover. Now, sometimes he is, his name is spelled Hanaver, H-A-N-A-V-E-R. Sometimes it's spelled H-A-N-A-U-E-R. My genealogists in that room, are, you get it, right? It's a very frustrating uh, thing. I know it's the same guy, though, because it's a pretty unique name. And he is an immigrant from Germany, and so I think that his name sort of gets morphed, right, um, over the years. He's the one legally um, who holds them. He has slowly built up a small fortune in the Pocahontas area. He established a mercantile business that dealt in human wares, um, a nice way of saying he's a slave trader, um, in addition to other stuff that he sells um, in Pocahontas. By 1855, L. Hanover and Company owned 25 town lots and two taxable slaves. Now that's defined as people, the state of Arkansas only taxed slaveholders for um, slaves who were over five years old and under 65. Other states shaved that off um, informally, like in Texas, there's not a cutoff on those ages, but the tax collectors like, okay, I won't, I won't count the babies, you know, or, or I won't count the old people, okay, and so they'll, they'll do it like that. So what I'm saying is that you, you can't take the tax record and say um, there are only two enslaved people, right, that he, there are only two taxable, so, right, so there may be a couple little, maybe a couple of older ones. Um, they were um, assessed as worth $1,200. The county taxed Lewis Hanover, the individual, for 40 acres and 10 lots for $4,000 and one taxable enslaved person worth six, assessed, I should say it that way, at $600 in the same period. He got a start in business with his non-slave-holding brothers. So they come over too and they're working together and then they kind of go their separate ways. By 1860, the 11 people who were held as Hanover's chattel, they grew corn, they didn't grow cotton, they worked stock, they uh, took care of hogs, and the farm is pretty big. Mary Ann Millam was probably the 23-year-old enslaved woman um, on the census listed um, as enslaved by John and Nancy Nutt in the neighboring county. Um, she's um, technically owned by Hanover, but she's 
being held, um, held um, at this other place. She makes moccasins, she spins thread, she weaves, she's allowed to hunt, and she traded in skins with peddlers passing through um, at the time. That part of her activity remembered by her daughter might have taken place after slavery ended. I've got this sort of qualifier in my book that some of that trading and that kind of free movement could have been um, a post-freedom um, thing. Um, but it's easy to imagine in this um, so-called sort of frontier society um, from all of the other examples that I've encountered, it's easy to imagine her having that ability because she's getting some of the benefit from the stuff she gathers and then the, the slaveholders are getting a little bit too. So it, it wouldn't be um, shocking, okay, um, if, it, if, it was a, if it was happening um, while she's still enslaved. And also, you would think that it would be sort of um, amazing if she suddenly, after becoming free, has all these skills, you know, in like trapping animals and stuff. So she's probably doing, she's probably been doing it since she was a kid. So the point about um, Mary Ann Milwom is that she's learning how to convert her surroundings into her material gain. Her family lives in kind of an isolated area when it comes to looking for a large um, black community. It's um, a scattered, small and scattered um, enslaved community in the era. Her lover and the father of her children was a white man, man named John Millam. Now work with me here because we know that white men are preying on enslaved women. There is no law against forcing sex on a black woman by a white man, free or enslaved, right? Um, on the books here. So we have to be careful with that. It's not an even playing field between John Millam, no matter how poor he might have been, um, and Mary Ann Millam. The reason I'm willing to call him her lover is because in the WPA, WPA interview, her daughter says that they loved each other, okay? Um, it has the details, so that's why I'm willing, because sometimes it's like, it's, it can be a difficult thing to characterize. Millam came to Randolph County um, from Alabama, and he's here by 1840. Um, he, he's there for at least um, some time during his 20s um, as a slaveholder. He's got one enslaved man that he holds for a while, and I don't know how long um, that lasts. Before he became involved with Marianne, he married and had five children with a woman from Tennessee who was named Mary also. Um, in 1850, the White Millums were small slaveholders in um, Lincoln County, Tennessee, but they had moved back to Arkansas by late 1859 or early 1860, and they kept a small farm. According to um, the daughter's recollection, Millam made his money from a very large still. It's not clear when and how Mary Ann and John Millam met, um, but the fact that she took his name and the manner in which her daughter remembered the relationship indicate that lasting connection. And what her daughter Betty said was, he had a wife and five children at home, and, um, but my mammy said he liked her and she liked him. And one of the fascinating things about the, well, one of the many fascinating things about the WPA ex-slave interviews is that um, they have to be treated very carefully because most of the people who are, well, there's a lot of reasons why they have to be treated carefully. One of them is that um, you're talking to people, if they're alive in 1934, they're either really old now or they're remembering their childhood. Most of them are remembering their childhood. And that can come with a um, shade of nostalgia. That doesn't mean that they look kindly upon the history of slavery in their family. They're remembering fondly when their parents were alive, when their, maybe their older siblings were alive, you know, and that kind of stuff. Um, so there's a little bit of that, okay, to be careful um, about, among other things. It's also interesting, though, how folks who think we should not be using the WPA interviews um, will say that it's hard for people to remember, you know, that far back. You know, some of the names and places and chronology, you know, can get kind of mixed up. But I find that you, they should be used and they should be used carefully. And I find that you can trust people when they say how something made them feel. And I think that... Um, that's really what we're looking for, you know, is that side of the experience. So maybe the town is wrong, maybe they got that year wrong or whatever, okay, fine. But the other thing is, and I know this from my uh, talking to my old people, 
they may not remember what they had for lunch, but they remember oh, yeah. that one day when I was 10 and this thing happened out in the yard and whatever, right? Like a clear as day. And so I, I see that over and over again in these WPA records. So for example, this woman, Betty, she's a little kid when this is going on. She remembers um, where this John Millam was from. He remembers, she remembers, yeah, he has a wife. She remembers how many kids he had. I went to the census, I found him exactly five kids. Like, right? And so it's like, it adds up, you know. Um, so, so anyway, they, they should be treated carefully, but we shouldn't just sort of um, throw them out. So I like the Marianne Millam story because in some ways it kind of encompasses a lot of what I try to do in my research, you know, in one story. A, this idea of who's a slave trader needs to be um, complicated a little bit for us. Um, I don't know if you guys ever watched, like, Django or any of those other, you know, Solomon <laughs> Northrop or, you know, 12 Years of Slavery and that kind of stuff. Um, but this idea of, you know, there's the sort of regular slaveholders and then there's the traders, you know. And they're the, they're the really yucky ones. And they're the really evil, you know, ones. Um, that's a myth perpetuated by slaveholders at the time, kind of feeling, you're trying to distance themselves for the sake of defending themselves against abolitionists or something. I know there is, it's, it really doesn't work very well. <laughs> um, uh, all slaveholders are slave traders, right? They're dealing in humans as chattel, so there's really not a distinction. And I think the Hanover. Hanauer, Hanover, Hanover, whatever you, however you want to call him, he's a really good example of that because he's a slaveholder, he's also buying and selling, and you can't really disentangle his mercantile business from those dealings. And that's true with, I, had, I had, eventually had to call it with the book and say, okay, and I, have a, I had a word limit anyway, you know, so there's only so much that let you put in there. Um, so I can't tell you every single, you know, early Arkansas trading post and link it, you know, to a handful of slaveholders, but I've done it with enough of them that I think the point, you know, um, is made. So you can pretty much guarantee um, that in all parts of Arkansas, you know, that's where that kind of stuff gets started. And then, of course, the most rewarding part um, of these stories is Mary Ann Millam's side of it, right? How she's able to just do her best to have a meaningful family and social life despite the brutality of this second slavery. The uniqueness of Arkansas's landscape in the way that it's probably the most sort of rugged and spread out and sort of undeveloped, okay, by um, 19th century, you know, white American standards. And she's converting her surroundings into her own gain for herself and her family. Um, and so, you know, it's th that story kind of grabs a lot of what I'm interested in in, in one piece. And luckily, it's local. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna quit now and um, see if you guys have any questions um, for me. Marianne, how did she spell that? How's it it's M I L A M. Around here, there is a family still in this county. We have Milans. Oh, we man, say Milan. It's okay, I, but that's but that's. <laughs> a I'm assuming John. You said his name is John Milan. Mm -hmm. Where did he live in Randolph County? Mm -hmm. Did he live in North Randolph County? Because there is like, yeah, there's, there's still Milan. Yeah. 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 And that's very interesting to me because, you know, that, that does kind of break. See, that's where it's a little bit, you know, like, you know, being a bear of bad news or whatever, I go to stuff. When I go to Chico County, it's really interesting because they're like, every, like I go to Lakeport and everybody, you know, all the white faces in the audience, they're like, yeah, that's great, Grandpa. So, and so, yeah, that's, you know, it's like, you know, you never know. And with the book, I don't know who's going to get in there and say, oh, you know, and, but it's just, people just need to lay it down and just right. be willing to And it's something learn. we try. Yeah, we've right. got to we right. acknowledge it. We don't have to be proud of it, but we got to acknowledge We got to acknowledge. Right. We got right. Well, my look, I remember that. Because that's one of my favorite sort of yeah. little snippets. One of the reasons I like it so much is because usually I only find out like one thing about an enslaved person. There's one instance in their entire lives where their name shows up in print or hand, or hand, hand right. Their name shows up in an official document. And usually that's the only thing I have. And for Marianne, there's other pieces, and so I was able to get some kind of idea, you know. So usually it's just that one, you know, little thing. My life, okay. How happened in my life? I, you know, I try to help other people out when I go to conferences. 
There was this young man, bless his heart, at the Agricultural History Society. Um, I think we were in like Louisville or something, and he was talking about these plantations down in Chico County, and he was going to get chick <laughs> And after, I was like, man, I wish I had talked to you before you got started, because it's, it's actually, I say Chico, but really it's Chico. Chico. You know, if you go down there, you know, you know, really want to do it right. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'm just wondering if you um, could speak to your perception of differences or what are there or what are the differences in the slavery as we have experienced it here with the non-plantation slavery versus the um, slavery on the larger plantations. Okay, Good so question. sort of smaller operations versus the larger plantations? Yeah, I, in Randolph County they, they refer to that as non-plantation slavery because uh, we didn't have plantations. They didn't, yeah. We're just small, small hill farms. Right. Small I usually, um, a term that you find historians using a lot is they'll call them yeoman farmers. It's, yeah. it's kind of like an upper middle class. So they're not planters, but they're yeoman farmers. But the essentials are the same. The law treats them exactly the same. They're protected by all the same things. The, um, Arkansas Supreme Court case in 1854 that set the precedent that any white person is justified in doing using whatever kind of legal force to subdue an enslaved person that they claim is rebelling. That precedent comes from Independence County. You know the, that's the white the incident. So legally, it's exactly the same. Financially, it's got the exact same benefits. Um, the difference is the day-to-day -day life of enslaved people. Like, what, are, what kind of work are they doing? How many people are around that are sort of of their, you know, how many opportunities are there for you to find a sweetheart, you know? You, you know, do you, how long, you, you might be more likely to be married to someone who's like three farms over, and you, you know, walk out there on Saturday night, you know, and come back to your farm on Sunday night, you know. Mm -hmm. so, I guess what I really want to make sure everybody understands is that it's the same type of slavery. Um, the experience for enslaved people is different. I think sometimes the assumption is that small holdings are places where slaveholders are going to be nicer or whatever, like that it's, that it's not as harsh. But really it's just harsh in a different way. That was exactly the question because yeah, in sure. our area we we tend to want to sugarcoat that experience, mm -hmm. and yet there's no basis for that, is it? Right. Mm -hmm. um, some of, all of the sort of brutal Excellent. stuff that um, you can find, a, I don't find any more brutality when it comes to violence in any one part of the state versus the other, or one type, one size holding versus the other. There, I would say that for enslaved people, the brutality is going to show itself in some different ways. So for example, on a smaller operation, say there's only three enslaved people who live there, those white folks know exactly where they're at all the time. There's no fade into the crowd, they know your name, they know your age, they know, you know, there's no anonymity, there's no, whereas on a large plantation, you know, you may have 25 people, you know, clearing new ground over here in this field, and then 15 people plowing under last year's stalks over there, and the overseer's riding back and forth, and, you know, maybe when he's around the bend, somebody can look and say, okay, like, let's, y'all just sit down for a minute and I'll watch, or something, you know, like that. Um, there's a little more, a way to sort of fade into the mist with that. Uh, on the flip side, though, the larger plantations are going to be so much more regimented in the work routine and in uh, the like provisions. So I would say around here, you're not going to find, or I would be very surprised to find like a rationing system like you find on some of those large um, plantations down towards you know the southeast. You know, one of those things where they say. You get this much meat for the week. Here's your cornmeal for the week. Here's your little bit of molasses for the week. If you eat it, then you should eat slower. You should divvy it out better. You know, whatever. Um, 
around here it's more likely to have an unlocked smokehouse because it's just like it's all hands on deck everybody's doing everything I can't be bothered with you um, to decide like when you can get you know this or that they're still watching it closely but it's just not the same type of like regimented um, routine um, on smaller operations, again, that's still a wealthy person. You know, somebody who owns two or three enslaved people is very upper middle class, okay? But even though middle class is a little anachronistic for that time period, that's my best sort of idea I could come up with um, with this. They are, they're doing pretty well, but they are watching, you know, really closely. That's going to be a bigger chunk. One enslaved person's labor is a bigger chunk of that person's overall wealth, and they're watching very closely. And... Sometimes that means they're working alongside those mm -hmm. folks, so they actually may know what it's like to have to plow, and so they may be more likely to take a break, you know? Um, so there's a little of that, okay? Um, but, again, at the same time, they're, they're just as interested in squeezing every bit they can out of them on the small and the larger. It just looks, it looks different, but it is essentially the same system. So I don't know if I'm contradicting myself in that. Yeah, that's very, oh, very, thank you. very illuminating. Oh, you know, the other, let me, uh, just the other thing to say is that um, there's really no clear distinction between, like, housework and field work, <coughs> except for on the very big plantations. Even on a plantation with maybe 70 enslaved people, you're only going to have, like, two who are only ever doing housework. Everybody else is... You know, they're doing whatever they're made to do whenever they're made to do it. Um, and so it, that's, oh, that's kind of a myth, I guess, what I'm saying about slavery is that there's, there's house slaves and there's field slaves. And, you know, they don't get along because they don't really know each other. Like, no, when it's time to pick cotton, they're all going out. And this is, um, this is such a frontier area that everybody, with the possible exception of the, even the small, like, possible exce exception of their wives and daughters, Everybody Maybe. was out there. Right. Maybe they're right. right. Depending they might on not be out there. How uppity they are, right? right. If they know their neighbors can't see them, they're like, okay, get out there. And then if the neighbor comes by, come back in because we need to perform gender domesticity, right? Like a certain way or whatever. So, but that, front, that whole frontier thing, made, right. life was a lot better to begin with. Right. That. And that is for North Arkansas, South <coughs> Arkansas, East Arkansas, West Arkansas. They all have that same outlook. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, right, okay. I'm Yes. I was just going to comment about uh, this interview you was talking about, about the person, how old you might have been, and stuff like that. I can tell you, being an old person, <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you what I was doing or where I was last Wednesday, <coughs> but I can tell you back in 1950, 52, I know what kind of vehicle my mom and dad had, wow. or yeah. what color the old. 50 mile Chevrolet car was a 48 mile truck, the H International Farm Hall, the name of our dogs, Pluto. I can tell you all kinds of details that I remember when I was like six, seven years old. Right. So yeah. I would tend to believe those interviews. I, I think right. they would be legit, unless the person just told me off the rock. Right. I would believe well, that they I feel the same way when it comes to uh, when they're clearly being really forthcoming about really personal or um, like traumatic aspects of it, the tendency would be to downplay, right? An elderly African American in 1934, it's not the height of lynching in the South, but it's not a low point either in the 30s. A white person comes to your front door and says, hi, I'm from the federal government and I want to ask you about slavery. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people button up, and they don't want to say much. And they'll protect themselves by saying, this is a pattern. This is not our, this is all of them. There's a pattern where they'll say, oh, I never saw anybody whipped or anything, but the neighbors down the road, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, right? So they'll kind of put some distance in between. So when they come through and say, I was whipped like this, I was gagged, maggots made a home on my body because I was restrained, uh, people did this and that to me, it's like amazing that they, so when they're willing to open up, I believe yeah. <laughs> I, the incentive would be to not, you know, tell that story. And sometimes they'll preface it with things like, look, I'm going to tell you the truth. You asked me, so I'm, I'm going to tell you. And, and then they'll, at the end of the interview, some of them will say, okay, well, they think that this might be the cost 
of getting on the relief rolls that all their white neighbors are on, but for some reason their name can't get on, right? And they'll say, well, you're from, can you check on this? Like, you're from the federal government, you're from, you're a New Deal, you're coming here part of the New Deal, like, can you check on this and that? So sometimes I think that they feel beholden to um, divulge more than they, you know, may have otherwise. So it is a very, they are very, they have to be treated very carefully. It's hard to assign them to students because of some of what's in there. You, they, they just need, you need a lot of coaching before, you know, you get, send it, give it to an 18 year old and they, they read someone saying, I wish we could go back to the slavery days. What they mean is, where this is the height of the depression, this is the depression within the depression, when you're interviewing me and at least I had a meal, you know, and I was eight and my parents were alive. You know, so that, some of that nostalgia that creeps in is, is it's got to be um, taken really carefully. Yes, sir. Um, in your lectures, where I'm, wherever you go, are you confronted with CRT? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I have never been confronted with CRT. I have a PhD in history, and I had, didn't know what CRT was until recently. Um, so what is it? I, I had read some, a little bit of some scholars who talked about things that seemed pretty obvious to me, which is that our, the, the legal codes that we used to have, the financial um, systems that we have had in the past, the social systems that we have had, have led us to where we are today, which just seems pretty captain obvious to me, but then when you <laughs> call it CRT, everybody freaks out. Um, it's a yeah. big scary label people throw Isn't it? Oh, I'm here to tell you. I, um, I was recently tenured, so I'm a lot more fearless on that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, you, know, uh, you know, somebody went through and said, we got an email from somebody at the, at the state government wanting to know who all was teaching who all was assigning the 1619 project, you know, and they, and I was like, I am, and, you know, because <laughs> I was assigning it, and then I was assigning different historians' takes on it, because some parts are, just, you know, they're just, they're mixing some stuff, I don't know, it's just, it's journalism, no, no. right, and it's not, <laughs> historians, we like our footnoted history, you know, and so you've got this interesting battle, and so I have assigned the 1619 project and legitimate criticisms coming from all sides, um, to like grad students, and it's such a it's such a gift. The controversy has been such a gift to me because it's such a everybody's heard something about it, and then it gets them into asking questions about what is history. What's the difference between history and memory? What does it mean to what's a founding date? Right? When is a country really founded? Like what? Who can do history? All of that all of that kind of stuff. You know. Um, so the sixteen nineteen thing has been a little more useful for me, um, but CRT is like what do you? It's like Look, the little kids looking under their bed for the CRT. It's gonna get on. Like, the lights off. I don't know. That one's a mess. That's a mess. Yeah, kids in the elementary school are not being taught CRT. No, so, that's no. I have not been. I have not been faced with that. It is always interesting, though, to see. I had always been in higher education till this last year, and I'm teaching high school and junior high. Get your PhD, you know, I always tell people, my college students, get your PhD or be teaching oh, no. junior high. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm telling yeah. them the opposite. I'm like, don't do it. <laughs> don't finish your dissertation or you'll have to teach junior high in the yeah. final years. Yeah. But <laughs> one of the things I'm finding teaching that age, you know, <laughs> as opposed to college students, is that their ideas are so unformed. Right. And it's a really good time to talk to them mm -hmm. about looking at historical perspective and that all history has more than one perspective. And right. that they need to be approaching it from that way. And so that's kind of been, to me, you talk about a gift, that's been a gift to me this last year. Right. And trying to be able to, to talk to some of those older students about how to deal with that. Yeah, I've there's a frame, right, yeah. for all of these different yeah. things. There are things that are objectively wrong, no matter what. Mm -hmm. So I try to make sure I don't both sides it to right. the fact that they're like, yeah, exactly. oh, there's people defending slavery, so maybe that means it wasn't. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, no, that's, that's objectively wrong. There were people at sides. their time that who knew done. it was wrong. Yes, no, um, Frederick Douglass was also a product of his time. <laughs> we were going to do that. Um, but at the same time, a, even a photograph, right, as a primary source doesn't give you the truth. What's outside of, 
you know, what's, and so, so yeah, like you said, the, the different yeah. legit mm -hmm. perspectives grounded in sources, you know, grounded in sort of good faith um, research questions, that's what we need to be teaching them, not some scary, you know, and you know, you guys know this stuff is timeless. You know, in the 50s, everybody, you know, people were saying teachers are teaching. They're trying to turn the kids communists and whatever. Teachers have always been criticized, and yet we owe them everything. So I don't know. It, it's, it's too bad. Teachers getting, um, always seem to be bearing the brunt of whatever sort of political moment that mm -hmm. we're in. Y'all way more than us, because I, I just, you know, I can walk away. <laughs> you know, y'all got parents, Linda. It is a lot. It's a lot more. You got, you got a question. Oh, um, oh I yes. just added like a basic question. Mm -hmm. Like, what inspired you or like what got you going into like wanting to like educate yourself or other people about this, I would guess you would say like not very mm -hmm. well taught mm -hmm. um, history up in Northern Arkansas. Like, what got you like into that? Thank you so much for that question. I um, I went to UALR for my bachelor's in history, and then I went down to North Texas for my master's, and I thought I was going to study the Southwest, like missions and stuff, and um, they have all these Texas history classes. You know how Texans are. And, and, so, and I was in this class called the Old South, and the professor was um, about 80 then. <laughs> And um, we had so many books that we had to read, and then we had like a list of um, extra books that we had to read. And I was like, well, I'm going to read. I'm going to find something about Arkansas and the Old South, you know, on this list. And there was one book about slavery in Arkansas called Negro Slavery in Arkansas, and it was published in 1958. And I was like, well, the professor's old, you know, maybe it's just an outdated list. And he said, no, this is the only book-length study of slavery in Arkansas, and I was like, okay, I did, somebody's got it, I'll do that, that'll be me, I'll do it, somebody's got to do it, I'll do it. And you know what happened? Um, I realized that a lot of people out there who don't know anything about this part of the world don't understand that Arkansas is essentially southern, it is part of the south. Like, you can talk to people, like, in Virginia, and they're like, Arkansas's not the south, I'm like, what? Johnny <laughs> Cash, Orville Faubus, Bill Clinton, <laughs> Billy Bob Thornton, the Duggars, like we are, this is the South. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> so what the 1958 book did was proved that slavery was important in Arkansas's history, but the whole book is all about white people. It's not actually about enslaved people. And that's, I know you're probably thinking, how can you write a whole book about slavery in Arkansas, and it's, but it's not actually about slaves? It's all about white planters, what they're trying to do, overseers, asking questions like, were enslaved people more criminal than white people? <laughs> Just really top-down, weird kind of stuff. Not racist in the way that you might expect something in 1958 you know, to be, Orville Taylor went on a sincere quest for this history, and so it's not, um, but it's not the way we write about slavery now, which is asking questions about what is it like for an enslaved person in Arkansas. He did not answer that question. He didn't even really ask that question. It's bizarre. It's very sort of top down. And so that's why my book might be a little unsatisfying, you know, for some people in the way that I, there's not a whole lot of kind of top down economic slavery as institution, you know, kind of stuff in Arkansas. It's a whole lot of stories um, with people's names and how old they were and where they lived because if I had it, I wanted to put it in there so that if, who knows, there may be a genealogist that could get, you know, carve out some, you know, flesh out some part of their family story that they didn't have. So, I got interested in it because I saw a gaping hole in the history, and um, so yeah, so it became my cause. <laughs> How much backlash have you had from you know, teaching the real thing? <laughs> it's not been too bad. I mean, my student evaluations, sometimes I have students who, because I teach like this, you know, I'm like, here we are, here's the truth, sorry, you know, I've ruined some Thanksgivings, you know, for people because they go back and tell their parents, like, if she said this, oh, it's true. Um, I find that once the book gets published, you get, there's like more credibility because it's not just some 
you know, because like they think I'm 12, like, and the, you know, like oh, this girl, like, <laughs> like, like, like no, I, there's a book, okay, you don't have to hear me, like, just, you, there's a footnotes, you know, whatever. So that has helped, yeah, but I, I do find that um, <coughs> at museum talks and stuff, some people feel like to acknowledge this history yeah, is to, to like book. disparage their family and their heritage. That's a kind of a scary word sometimes. Um, and so I don't. I try to ease that, you know. With the students, I'm more gentle. But I, but when I go to a museum or something, or somebody back there saying, "Why do you keep saying white or black?" I'm like, well, it's because that's what <laughs> white people just didn't. White people weren't enslaved as chattel. Well, I mean, you know, so sometimes it gets get a little, but. But yeah, I mean, most people really want to know. So we are we are in an okay time at, at that at that level. You know, maybe our society's going to have the teachers in weird ways, but um, as far as like the public history stuff, we're in a good we're in a good chapter. Yes, ma'am. To me, what's sad is it seems like so much of that history is lost. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you dig and dig and dig, but. I think a lot of stuff does get brushed under the carpet and just intentionally lost. And um, I think it's it's great that some people do they are willing to say we've got to find it. it right. It's part of our history. We've got to talk about it, and we've got to decide. Yep. You know, even though it wasn't maybe not right, and it was and, it, and it's not morally right, but. It's part of our history, and we can learn from it. Right. Yes. Because this is the example I always think, and this is a true. I mean, I'm giving you the example from the movie, but the story, his story, is true. Solomon Northup's story is true. Um, if you guys watch the movie Twelve Years a Slave, there's the point where he's in the inside of the house because the angry overseer is like out there coming for him. Or I can't remember exactly what led up to it. And Benedict Cumberbatch is the slaveholder, and I can't think of what his character, I can't think of what his actual name, but anyway, Benedict Cumberbatch, he's got a gun, and he's kind of walking around, looking at the windows, you know, kind of protect him, and Solomon Northrup says, you know what, like, I got kidnapped from the North, I'm not even supposed to be here, which actually none of them are supposed to be there, right, but anyway, he's saying, like, hi, this is not even, like, legal, and like, whatever, and Benedict Cumberbatch's character says, I can't hear this, I have debts to pay. And that's exactly the thing that people need to remember. Not the caricature of the redheaded Michael Fassbender. I love that actor so much. I hated watching him act like that in that movie. The red, the angry redheaded guy, you know, the character, right? That's the sort of caricature of the evil, and that that did exist because this institution is this umbrella under which all manner of human. Relative kindness and relative cruelty is protected, right? These people have blank check to act however they feel, um, with very little limits, right? So that so they existed, but the everyday, the people who let this keep happening are the people saying, "I can't hear this. I can't listen to this. I have debts to pay." People who are in his character, he was also a minister, right? So people who are in every other aspect of life seen as moral, upright, good. Um, all of the leaders, all of the positive things you can think about someone in a cutie, they're also perpetuating this because by the time you get to 1861, they're, they're in so deep that it affects the way they see not just their finances, but the way they see their family, their Bible, the, their, their, the, everything around them, right? And so they don't want to see the truth. So the, the, the lesson of slavery is that. Not that crazy, creepy people kept it going, but that everyday people kept it going. That's the lesson, okay? So, yeah. Big picture question okay. related to that then. As a historian, especially whose focus is on this topic, how do you view our world today, our society, and have we learned this lesson? Are we ever going to learn it? What, are we, what can we do to make it better? I'm usually a glass half full kind of person. I usually, I usually come in like pretty bouncy and optimistic, but I, I, I'm gonna be honest that I, I see us taking steps backward on the willingness to be honest, 
with ourselves about our own history because of some, mm -hmm. really just to score political points. I actually don't think that most of the people who are pushing to silence this kind of history are really that invested. I don't think they go to sleep at night worried that a kid will learn about slavery. I think they go to bed at night knowing that that's the kind of thing that resonates with voters and they're going to push it and they don't care. Yeah. Which is really bad, right? That's, that's, I'm really getting cynical uh, with you guys. So I, I find that um, we, are, we are going backwards in the willingness. And, and it's, it's so hard to get the young ones to understand that things don't just automatically get better over time. Like people have to push and people have to make you know, things happen. Stuff doesn't resolve itself just because time has passed, right? Um, that if we want our education to look a certain way, we have to actively maintain it. Um, if we want our public conversations to be a certain way, we have to actively, you know, like you guys are doing here, just amazing um, work. So I, I am um, discouraged lately, um, but I find that I might be in a unique position to at least in my institution or like maybe for higher ed in Arkansas just do my best to not be scared <laughs> and say this is what I'm teaching in my class and if you know you, you can't you know mm -hmm. a tenure is not it's not a um, full protection <laughs> it means they have to actively fire you <laughs> it just it means they can't say oh you're not renewed next year they have to actually go through the trouble to fire me um, and so I, I think that those of us who can need to stick our necks out, you know. Um, and so I've been lucky to be mentored by people who are willing to. But I don't think, so like my PhD advisor, Jeannie Wayne, you know, one of the most important Arkansas historians ever, I was mentored by her and she sticks her neck out. She doesn't, you know, she, she doesn't worry about, um, you know, if somebody's going to try to, as they say, ratio her on Twitter, she's on Twitter. But if she was, she probably wouldn't worry about that or... Um, or whatever, but there are websites dedicated to making lists of professors who are too like I don't I don't really I don't know just lists of professors who are teaching too much slavery or borderline CRT even though those people don't know what that is anyway. But um, it's uh, I don't know. There's but but we gotta. So I am I am disappointed in where we're at right now, but not completely like without hope. Do you think a lot of that has to do with the fact though, that we should be educating our, our kids at home? Like we should be, oh. by doing this and educating ourselves and then educating our kids and our grandkids at home as well. Yes. Because they're not they're not going to receive that necessarily outside. Right. You can't raise, you can't raise good, healthy, tiny humans if you're not, you know what I'm saying, teaching them how inappropriate and wrong this was. Right. And, and that we don't want to continue that path. Right. We continue to do that to yes. Others. In any, in any yeah. Because the middle school and the high school teachers are low paid, they are always watched so carefully, and so we've got to, you know, they're, they will be the first ones to start buttoning up and just making that lesson shorter or um, glossing over some stuff, and not to criticize them, but just to be real about, you know, their job security, um, and or, or just like the pressure, right, like at the job. And so this has to happen at home. We've got to be ready when they get to us in college to just go, just wide, just throw those doors wide open. We also, as a society, I think we need to reward changing your mind based on new information. Okay. We don't do that very well in our society. If someone changes their mind about something and says, well, I used to think this, now I think that, we're on them. And I think that because that's our culture, people who might like start to feel like, oh yeah, you know, I think I know better now, may not be willing to say so. They just quiet and they let those loud voices like keep going. So I think that we need to encourage <coughs> questions, right? Leave people with questions and encourage um, people when they, even if what you want to say is, yeah, duh, <laughs> you know, like you, you just now figured this out, just. This is just my, this, you guys treat people how you want, but I, I'm finding that maybe we just need to normalize accepting when someone says, you know what, I used to think this and now I think that. Mm -hmm. I was raised to think that the Confederacy had nothing to do with slavery and that slavery wasn't that bad and I found out 
differently when I saw the sources for myself, and great. You know, like people, we need to, and that's hard. You know, that's kind of more of an individual, you know, kind of thing, so. I think there's a lot of things about the evils in society that people try to deny, and I think that's a lot of what's wrong with our world today, is that we just allow people to justify their actions, whether it hurts others or not, and that's that's just not right. And yet, and it's not comfortable to speak out against those things. You know, I, there's a lot of people trying to say the whole cost never. Things you like, never <laughs> thought would get into the level of mainstream that they are. It's it's it's, it's amazing. shocking. I know it is shocking. But we do. I, I, I agree with what Michelle say is we are responsible to teach our kids to want to have a hunger to know the truth. Right. And then to take a stand for what's right. But we we face a lot of complacency in the home. Um, to, I work this school. <laughs> but um, it, it, I'm not a classroom teacher. My daughter's a junior high class for a history teacher. So she's on a little sabbatical right now. Oh, and man. She so she's the, right there in the trenches, too. Yeah. But we, we just have to get to a point that we cannot deny our history. We have to be willing to talk about it. <coughs> and there's too many people trying to just create other, other things to distract. Yeah. Um, can I say something? Yeah. Okay. So as a young person, still in school learning about history and the versions that schools are giving children as the whitewashed version of how this happened and what happened and so so on. How like what advice would you give as um like just to like children adding on, like how would you like tell them to go out of school, like of what they're teaching you to like continue to learn like the full truth because as a biracial person, I'm all in it for black history and learning about just how we got here today and how it all started. So like what would be that advice for like students and just young people like learning our history? What would be your advice for doing? You know, um, I would say that we are at a unique time in the way that there's so much available at your fingertips. Um, there are all kinds of sort of crowdsourced mm -hmm. projects, gathering material about this time period that you could read for yourself and not have any filter from anybody else. A good secondary source is blackpast.org. Um, you can always Google whatever topic it is you're interested in and put the word syllabus next to it in your Google search, S-Y-L-L. A B. <laughs> I'm getting. I'm, I'm ready. I need supper. <laughs> so, um, it, a lot of times there are um, professionals in whatever that subfield is uh, will put together materials as a syllabus and post, you know, online. Um, after those shootings in Charleston, there was a Charleston syllabus. A lot of historians putting together a lot of black history. And they actually, University of Georgia Press ended up publishing as a volume because it got so many like, downloads or whatever. But, um, so just using the stuff um, that's available to you via the web. Um, whenever you can, find out if something is a primary source, meaning a first-hand account. Somebody who saw this thing happen is writing about it. Doesn't mean they're not writing about it in a racist way, but they were there, they saw it, read what they think about it, and then read someone else's, and then someone else's, and kind of get a fuller picture of what the debate is in that society you know, at that time. So I would say, man, you know, use your powers for good. You guys know how to find things online. <laughs>